And um, I'm Susan Tuline. I am with Central Wyoming College, and I have the honor of being the moderator today for this wonderful panel that we have. Um, I'd like to start first by thanking the National Museum of Wildlife Art for hosting us, making fantastic lunches. I hope you're all um, becoming satiated. I would like to thank the uh, University of Wyoming Foundation that has financed the lunch and provided support for our three presenters to come here and um, include us in their musings. Uh, the Teton County Library um, and the Humanities Council. All of us have been working together collaboratively over the past three years um, and enjoying very much the opportunity to bring these presentations here to Jackson and in this upcoming year some of these presentations will be brought or similar presentations to Sheridan and Gillette to allow others throughout the state the opportunity to hear some of these. But our next one is June 3rd here um, at the Wildlife Museum and I hope you consider um, coming and joining us then for that time. So. Right now is an opportunity for us to all have a conversation, um, hopefully weaving in some of the themes, if you can find similar themes, amongst the three of our, our, of our presenters. I would like to actually tell class that I wish my economics class was as interesting and simplified as I was in grad school, because I perhaps <laughs> Um, and I'm going to ask, a, uh, I'm going to start off with a question. I know the rest of you have many other questions. But if Monty Python in the early 1960s were to make a, a play or a movie now addressing the politics of economics and the religious issues that are going along, how would they de be depicted? They made life of Brian. And Life of Brian is about church and state and the, the construction of organized religion in the way it's used. So they've already done that. Um, economics, I think they're more interested in politics. Um, so I'm not sure that, they, of course, they did economic things about consumption. They're never actually, Mally Python was never actually had a specific political message. They were just kind of anti London, anti the establishment. Um, and making fun of the foibles of everyday life. And I'm sure they would have something good to do with the economy, um, but being not of their brilliance, um, probably I can't write it for them. But maybe Paul is figuring something out right now. Well, one of the things, I, I've actually talked to Life of Brian uh, several times, and it's, it is a fun movie about poking fun at religion and state etc. But it really pokes fun at empire. It's, it's really about trying to have a, extend your government power and with that, your religious power. And in fact, if you actually look at the history of the empire, the religious power was always in front of the government and the government sort of followed, followed the missionaries uh, rather than vice versa. And so with, with, with Python, um, I mean, if you know the life of Brian, there's this great scene where Brian is is caught trying to write in Latin uh, a graffiti. He's trying to say Romans go home in in Latin, and the the centurion catches him, and you have this sort of classroom moment where the centurion corrects his Latin uh, and then tells him to write it a hundred times. And this is, of course, the Roman Forum in Jerusalem, so he covers the walls with, with this slogan of Romans, go home. And, and, and that sort of captures Python's view of the, the link between government and religion and, and empire, I think. Klaus, do you have a... I, I am going to so punt on this because <laughs> <laughs> separation of church. And I, I grew up in a missionary family where watching Monty Python was considered sinful, and so <laughs> I, I now realize how much I missed. <laughs> 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 Did Terry Gilliam make the movie Brazil? Yes, yes, absolutely. The, that's ec economics. Oh yeah, and uh, Fisher King, which is also very much about economics. What was that one called? The Fisher King. With Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, that yeah. that that film is very much uh, about economics, the haves, the have-nots. Um, what's our responsibility? Why is New York in such a mess? Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely a film that's addressed directly to the economic 
um, condition in America at the time the film was made. I don't think of that as Monty Python, I guess, because it's Terry Gilliam who has a, a somewhat different vision in some ways. He's much more politically involved. Who correlates in English literature history with that outrageous, almost scatological Monty Python kind of uh, approach? I mean, we must have had outrageous comedy before. I can think of Rabelais, maybe, in France, but can you think of anybody who's in Chaucer? Chaucer, which is my other, uh, I offered two topics for this for this weekend, and one of them was a Chaucer topic. But Chaucer's very much in, in the vein of Monty Python, particularly the Canterbury Tales. So we had to go from Chaucer to Monty Python? Yeah. From Chaucer to Monty Yeah, we had to jump from Chaucer to Monty Python then? Chaucer was just where, where I, as Tristan Shandy, as was just pointed out, um, I mean, I think throughout literature, Oscar Wilde. Um, some of them are scurrilous, but, but Terry Jones, you know, was a medievalist, um, one of the original Monty Python members, and he actually goes to medieval conferences, and I've had dinner with him a couple of times, um, so there is a real direct connection um, there, but certainly. Bob? It's uh, it was quite interesting, your circular patterns that you had on the screen there, about the peaks and the valleys, about the valleys, you know, when things are down, we need sort of government stimulus or whatever. Then when you get up on the crest and it starts going better, my question is how you got to keep the damn politicians with respect spending more money? You know, they're supposed to save, they got all these goodies they want to put on, so the damn thing keeps going the wrong direction again. I guess. <laughs> I enjoyed your presentation, it was very good. Yes, sir. Um, you, you've shown, a, <clears throat> shown us very clearly how the subject matter has changed in pedagogy and universities, uh, perhaps since some of us attended. And I'm wondering uh, how you think the students have changed. We're sort of the wrong people to ask because, you know, the, the kind of person that becomes uh, a professor with a PhD and does all that studying is the kind of person that always stuck their hand up, that always tried to get the attention of the teacher. And, and, and that was that small, annoying part of the class that nobody else really liked. Um, and um, so I think that part of the class is still there. Um, the real difference, um, in terms of the way I think, is that my students, and perhaps this was starting when I was, when I was in college, is my students are very much upfront about who they are. Uh, they will dress the part, they will speak the part. Um, I have to, I, I wouldn't say I have problems with class discipline, but, but um, you know, whoever my students are, I have to teach them. And it doesn't matter if they're, they're black or they're white or they're Hispanic or uh, if they're from abroad, if their English is good or it's not good. Uh, their sexual orientation, of which some of them are, are quite upfront about, it doesn't matter. Who's ever in front of me, I have to teach. And I actually don't find that a problem. What I find a problem is teaching the guy, the person who doesn't want to learn. And as long as somebody wants to learn and is going to, you're going to try, I enjoy teaching. You know, I mean, they come at all different levels of ability, but they're there because they want to learn. They're curious. Um, at least the students I teach, I, I find it very impressive. Of their I teach this class, and that's the lecture that I gave today is part of it, um, called the Econ Law and Government, which is a freshman class, the very first class they get, and I just try to make it as controversial as I can. I just, I in there, I throw all these economic ideas in there, right? I go into waterboarding and torture, I go into just anything, because it's supposed to be about the, the U.S. Constitution, and it's, and there's a politi uh, um, political science class that does it, that fulfills their requirement to take a course that is about the U.S. Constitution in some way. Or, and there's a history, and then I'm the econ version of it. And so I've just taken that as license to do whatever I'm interested in, but yeah, make it controversial. And I've been very impressed that all the time I have them, I scramble them so they can't even sit next to their friends. I, I literally <laughs> have them, and then I have them discussing groups of, of four or five that I scramble three times during the semester. How many just, students in your course? 120. And I've just been so amazed at how civil the discussion always is and how they manage to 
that have completely different views and that, you know, there's foreigners that have got an Iraqi student in there this, this year. And they just have to have completely civil discussions with it. And, and kind of surprised me. I didn't think that would be possible. It seems to me that your uh, model, which was wonderful, is also very limited because uh, it deals with this uh, very isolated part of the worldwide economy. And there's a heck of a lot more going on out there than is just happening in the United States. And obviously, with fast transport communications and other changes we've had since most of us were young, uh, we've become far more of an international economy than just a domestic economy. And I'm wondering how you see that trending and uh, how, how that changes all of our models and how we eventually become a world instead of a bunch of little spots on the map. I, that makes me wonder how exports and imports have changed over time, which I don't know. I, I, oh yeah, you don't know this stuff, do you? I don't know this stuff, <laughs> as in I don't have it at the top of my I mean, So. About 15% of our expenditures on, on imports, about a little bit less than that, or no, it's on the imports a little bit less than that because we import more than we export, is on exports. And so it's the, the rest of the world is about 15% of everything we do. Yeah, I don't know that that will change it, uh, necessarily. Well, no. But one of the funny things in that puzzles economists is that most trade is actually between similar countries. So most trade in the world is between rich countries in Europe and, and between America and Europe and America and Japan. And so it, it, yet I, I think I could see that as growing over time and maybe we will get to be where we very much have to worry about the, the rest of the world. If you live in a little village in India or Harare, you're not buying things off the export market because you're growing them. Right, right. Although often what you're doing is you're growing it, if you're in India or if you're in some places in Africa, you're growing it to send it someplace else. I mean, these countries that have famines do not have famines because they can't grow anything. They have famines because what they grow is going out of the country because it takes a it gets a much better price where it's going, and they don't get enough in return to feed themselves. Uh, so they, what has happened is, as, as, as many of these agricultural countries have become part of the uh, international food market, um, they have lost the ability to feed themselves because they no longer grow traditional crops. They've become part of a, of a large-scale um, uh, company farm or company farm process where, where they're not growing for themselves, they're growing to ship away. And of course the assumption by the market is that they will get paid enough for their own needs, and of course that isn't happening because there are middlemen and they don't know what the value of their goods are, and even if they did know the value, they can't get it there by themselves. Um, so um, just as an economic level, I mean, the connections are happening, and um, they're not always beneficial. They're not always both ways, uh, and, and I don't know the, the economics, how that fits into in the class as well. So, uh, Mar uh, Marcia Sen, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning economist, he got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, has written very much on this. And he's pointed out that <coughs> there is no democracy in the world that's ever had a famine. It's always, a, it's about the distribution of, of a, which I did not get into at all, right? That's, I, I was just talking about aggregate consumption, aggregate labor, but the, the politics is all about how does it get distributed. And Paul's exactly right. In, in Ethiopia, there's companies that make, that make good money selling organic, maybe some of this <laughs> comes from there, organic vegetables to Europe. But it, it's, it's how the, the, the real stuff that we care about, who, get, who gets it, that, that's what all the policies are about. Economists just try to worry about, let's make the, the pie as big as possible, leave the politicians to divide it. But how the pie gets divided is very important. How do, you, how do you think the banks to uh, loosen up their grip on the reserve? that they're sitting on now? Well, they would love to let it out. They just don't see that it's going to give them the return that they want. So it's not, it's not that they... Lower the expectations. Very good point. So if you, if you reduce the interest rate, which the, the Federal Reserve has tried to do, then at some point, their, their expectations about what return they should get in order to lend out 
are going to come down, right? Because where they used to be able to get 5% and wouldn't lend at 4, now they're happy to lend at 1 because if they get any kind of return. But the, a, a big part of the problem right now is interest rates are as low as they can be. They're basically zero. The, the, and still banks are saying, no, we just, we're just so freaked out by everything that's happened, we still don't want to lend. Or we just don't find people that want to lend from us, want to borrow from us. And so that's why the government has to step in and do all this other stuff. Otherwise, a lot of, a lot of dealing with booms and recessions, you can do just by manipulating the, the interest rate. But we're now at a point where that, that, that weapon doesn't work anymore, because we've done as much as we can, the interest rate is zero and still. That's good sometimes because, you know, you had your, on your graph, the piling up of the blue IOUs to the government, it's not going to make a difference. Well, except when you have to service the debt, if, if you're paying zero to one percent now, trillions, it's not big, it doesn't cost you that much. If, you, uh, if you're paying five, ten percent, uh, pretty soon that becomes such a huge portion of the budget, you're not going to be able to afford to do anything else. Right, so, so econo that's another argument economists are making right now for let, let's use this opportunity to spend, on to spend on infrastructure, make our economy stronger so that it will be more productive in future because the government can now borrow extremely cheaply. Mm -hmm. So this is a great time to do that. Mm -hmm. And you're right, once the economy comes back up, the interest rates will come back up and then, then borrowing starts becoming a, more, a lot more expensive and so then we want sure. the government to uh, hold back. That you talked about this morning with church and state, is there any indication as to which of those models is more sustainable over time to maintain social, economic, or political stability? I gave you a series of models, and um, of course the earlier models are, are now historical. Um, they were set up, they keep being tested, they keep being tried. Um, the problem with mo uh, models where there is an individual at the head of the government is, is is always a problem of succession and the quality of the individual. If you get a good individual in there who, who happens to have the skills, the understanding, the talents, the information to do to do the job well, then that's you know a great king, a great a great uh, leader, uh, a great queen. Um, and what often happens is they don't is they're so busy looking after their country, they don't look after their kids. Uh, and then, you know, one of the kids comes up and they are absolutely lousy. So, so it's, it's one of these cyclical things um, where, where you just, you know, can't guarantee stability uh, that I would say, I mean, at, since this is when I live, I happen to think that the post-enlightenment notions of government are the best. They're still pretty messy. Uh, um, I happen, I've lived in England uh, a, a number of years and got to watch a parliamentary system up close, and, and uh, I will say it just confirmed my prejudices that the presidential system is a better system. Um, but a presidential system is also a more rigid system. It's much harder to change course. Um, you know, you vote, I mean, we had uh, 60 Democrats in the Senate uh, up until uh, the last midterm election. They couldn't get everything done because the opposition party required them to have a supermajority for every decision. Um, whereas if you have a parliamentary system, the, 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 the party with the majority or the party coalition with the majority, they can do things. They can do whatever they want, and the other party can't do anything. Um, so check trades, trade-offs. Um, but I, I, I will say that you know, as a modernist, I, I happen to like the citizen, a uh, responsible government, because uh, at least it's responsive. I wanted to follow that up. In, in, you didn't emphasize, and maybe you didn't uh, intend to, but the problem of the tyranny of the majority in mm -hmm. uh, some of the models, so to speak, if not all. Yeah, the tyranny of majority is a, is a real problem. Um, and I remember um, I remember a, a Boy Scout manual uh, for, for, for patrol leaders back when I was, I don't know, 12 or 10 or something. And uh, they were talking about the patrol leader representing the will of his group to the, to, to the, to the bigger troop. And uh, the options were, should the patrol leader 
represent his own interests? Should the patrol leader represent the interests of the majority, take a vote and, and see what they, or should he represent the interests of the majority and the minority of, of his people? And of course, the right answer, according to the book, was the third answer, where you're, you want to emphasize both. Um, the whole separation of church and state idea is to prevent the majority from uh, outlawing the, what, the major, what the minority wants. And that works both in religion. Um, uh, we've had a Protestant majority uh, in, in our country for <coughs> most of its history. Um, and we had a lot of problems uh, in, you know, around the 1900s, early 1900s, with the influx of Catholic immigrants. Um, and the Protestant majority was not well behaved. Um, and that's why there's a Catholic parochial school system, because the Protestant majority wanted to raise the Catholic kids in what, were the, what we can now see in hindsight is clearly Protestant ways. Um, and they didn't quite see it that way, but that was, again, they didn't want to be flexible, they didn't want to compromise, um, so the Catholics created a parochial school system uh, to go alongside that. Um, and that also works in, in, in governments as well, in, 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 other, in other ways. So that tyranny of majority is a real issue, and, and it's why there's a separation of church and state. First, I, I think it would be a really good idea to have a presentation like yours, class, on, on economics to seniors in high school. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a way of keeping it. <laughs> I, uh, because, you know, I just, in other words, before they vote, yeah. The yeah, first yeah, yeah. Time, before they start getting, uh, that they have a little more understanding of how things work, and before they just start making it beliefs. <coughs> and uh, so that's the first thing. The other thing is that the uh, the U.S. may soon become an oil exporter, and uh, which is a whole different situation for us for a long time. It's going to affect that import-export calculation a lot because of the price of oil. I don't, I don't. Don't you think so? No. I, I, the U.S. just does not have anywhere close to the reserves to become an oil exporter. It's, there's a little bit of confusion in the news about we're, we are exporting some refined products. Yeah. But it, oil is actually something I do know about. <laughs> and we, have, we are nowhere close to being an expert. So it's not and a net. never will be anymore. It's, it's, a not, it's a net versus a, just the fact that we're shipping away products. We're bringing in a little bit. A little bit. But then, you know, we're, if, if our refineries happen to be closer to the border than Canadian refineries, we might send some gasoline to get to Canada, that kind of thing. Right? But there's. But there's we're not export. We're, our oil output has gone up a whole lot, but we're still importing. I think 60% of our oil use, and if that's not going to change, okay, I just thought with some of the oil shale development, some of the newer technology, that we're getting a lot closer to that. To be closer, as in it used to be that we imported 70%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think is going to happen with Greece and their economy? <laughs> <laughs> So Greece is much more like a regular household, right? Because it's not its own, it doesn't, it's not a sovereign country that issues its own currency and can devalue or um, do any of the things that, that sovereign countries with their own currency, like the UK, like the US can do. And so it is very much like a regular household where the bank lent it a whole bunch of money, which is the Germans and all the French and the, the big banks lent lent Greece a whole lot of money, they, they fudged their books with the help of Goldman Sachs, I understand. <laughs> so that's one of those exported services. <laughs> but now, yet, yeah, all they can do, given the situation they're in, is what a regular household needs to do when it's overspent, which is cut its budget and try to, try to repay. But unfortunately, because it is also very much like a country, the very act of cutting back the budget is shrinking its economy so much, the circular flow, that it's actually that its its deficit is actually going up rather than down. So it's I told I talked about the, the paradox of thrift, right? There's a paradox of austerity that in some in some cases austerity can actually make you less able to pay to repay your money or increase your deficits, and that's exactly what's happening. So they're just in an incredible mess. They will be for years. And 
stepping out of the euro won't be great for them either, so they're screwed. <laughs> this is a Wyoming conversation, and we're here in Jackson Hole with our colleagues from Laramie. And I think we sometimes tend to forget how in Wyoming we're really, we can be very moralistic, rugged individualism, self-reliance. Um, and so if I'm rich, it's because I deserve all that wealth. I worked harder than anybody else. Um, I, um, and I, don't I deserve it. I don't necessarily have an obligation to share it with others who are less fortunate. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have a bill now in the Wyoming legislature to test welfare recipients for drugs, which implies implicitly that these guys are deadbeats. You know, they're deadbeats. They, uh, they're not on the welfare rolls um, because they were somehow or another less fortunate, stumbled in life. They're deadbeats. So just um, comments in terms of how we here in Wyoming might need to take a look at our own moralistic lens through which we view politics and the economy. Thank you. Morality play, we never really got into that, but you know, in, in the Sally and Bob story, who's to blame? I, I, you could blame Sally to, to, for feeding Bob's habit, <laughs> right? You could, and that's the, that would be the conservative view of what happened. Or the liberal view of what happened, right? These, these evil Wall Street companies that wrote all these subprime mortgages and, and snookered people into buying them. Or you can say, no, Bob is the, the idiot that fell for it <laughs> and overspent and didn't, um, wasn't frugal enough. But the reality is, once they got into the mess, once the Minsky moment happens, they're both hurting. So regardless of who you want to blame, they're both out of work. I mean, on average, right? The, when firms fire people, they don't go and, and, and say, well, we'll hire the Bobs, but not the Sallys, or we'll fire the Bobs, but not the Sallys. No, everybody hurts. So in that sense, it, economics is not a morality play. You just need to get people back to work and not talk about who was bad and who was, who was good. And put the, put the structures in place to try to avoid that it happens again. I don't know that we would be able to come to any consensus on morality. But I do feel that there is a great consensus on the part of all of us in expressing our thanks for your magnificent altruism in taking time to come across this great state when you've all got families and other responsibilities and things to do on a weekend. And it doesn't mean that Monday classes are dismissed or anything else. You still got to jump back in and be in the classroom ready to go. And so it's a deep sense of appreciation. And we hope that we are reasonably apt students. Um, for myself, having spent 24 years in education, this was my first, sadly, first introduction into economics. <laughs> it was also my first introduction into Monty, Monty Python. <laughs> and it was also my first introduction into historical perspective on the, on the Abrahamic religions from a his time point of view. And so we thank all of you very much. We would probably all like to know if there's an opportunity where we can pursue any of these further. Because if we had to choose to say, I want to go here, here, or here, we'd be hard pressed to say where we want to go next. And does the, does the university have seminars? Are there online opportunities? And you might not be able to answer those now, but perhaps they could be made available to us through our local news media. Thank you again. Do you have any sense of the likely candidates for the next Minsky moment? <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting when you read the history because it's always a moving target, right? They, we thought we had stuff handled and there's a new way that the financial industry comes up with. And it's, again, I, I wouldn't call them evil, right? They're, they're just doing what their, their job is, which is make a return for the investors. But the, the, the psychology is a huge part of e economics, too, and that's, that's where the whole economics profession is going now, where we realize all our fancy math models, we need to bring in human, human failure, human psychology, and that's what goes on. The people start getting overexcited, overconfident that they've got it nailed now. But the irrationality you can't predict, right? Irrationality is always irrational in a new way. 
And so I can't, no, I, can't, I, do, <laughs> I do not have the answer to what industry you should not be investing in right now. <laughs> uh, there's one out there, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> I wonder, in the background of all of this, there's more and more, pe more people in the United States, but also, of course, worldwide, a lot more people. So, depending on your topic, could be, um, what effect does that have on the presentation that you gave today? Knowing that there's just more people to interact with, do things happen faster? More like economic cycles happen quicker. You know, religious conflicts happen more often. One of the things about uh, the communication is that um, if we decide that we like uh, some religious ideas or we want to explore religious ideas, uh, it. At least at the, at the at the fairly elementary level, that kind of thing is readily accessible. Um, you you can go out and explore anything from you know tantric Buddhism to um, uh, Quakerism to you know religions that have gone extinct, and 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 you can find information about them on the web, and sometimes it's even accurate. Uh, and and so that's out there. There are ways to make connections through email, through cheap telephones. Um, Etc. I have a, a faculty member whose uh, family, uh, was born and raised in Tunisia, his family is still back there, uh, and he spent all of the last year just sort of engrossed in trying to, through electronic means, uh, figure out what was going on, what was happening, was his family safe, um, you know, was his kids getting to school, you know, what was happening to his college-age kid now that the, that the um, you know, universities had closed because of the, of the protests. Uh, so there's, there's an ability to get out and get connected and get involved. Now that also means that there's an ability to get involved in things you may not respond positively to. Things that make you angry, things that, that you hate, um, things that make you hate. Um, and that kind of stuff is out there and it can happen very quickly. You want to learn how to make a bomb? There's, there's ways out on the internet to help you help you do that. You want a reason to dislike somebody, um, there's ways out there to do it. Um, um, if you, I was told that if you type in Santorum on the internet, uh, the first thing that comes up is a website against him. Right. Um, so, so, we need to learn how to um, realize that we're no longer in our own little village, in our own little state, and that everybody around us more or less acts the, and thinks the way we do. Uh, that, that by being connected, we're connected to a world that is not like us and will never be like us. And that tends to make people uncomfortable. Uh, and, and we need to learn, maybe teach our kids how to be more comfortable with that uncomfortableness. That, that's my point. I think it's issues of access. You know, I argued at the beginning that no one can see spam a lot if they don't go to Broadway and spend 150 to 350 dollars. Well, actually, the whole thing's on the web. Um, so yeah, there, there's access. The, the culture becomes more quickly distributed, um, and I think that's you know both, as Paul points out, a good thing and a bad thing. Um, I'd like to quickly answer the question over here. Uh, for those of you who are interested in British comedy, Caroline McCracken Flusher related to Paul, is teaching a three-weekend compressed video class in British comedy, which will go through the historical um, movement, but also definitely includes Monty Python, um, and it's next fall. So, if you really want to, you can do more British comedy. <laughs> and from your very own compressed video site in Jackson. So. Yes, we, we certainly have a, a number of online uh, and uh, compressed video offerings. Um, uh, for example, uh, Religious Studies has a very teaches, a, teaches a, a number of courses, everything from our sort of six religions, comparative religion course, which we offer almost continuously throughout the year, uh, to courses in Islam or the Bible or, or any number of things, all of which you can take online. Um, and, and given that Wyoming has cheap tuition, it's not that expensive uh, in a relative sense. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I would like to thank the three of you very much for joining us.